Good morning. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 through 31. And I'll give you all a little bit of time to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 21 through 31. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating and various parts in various kinds of tongues are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers do all work miracles do all possess gifts of healing do all speak with tongues do all interpret but earnestly desire the higher gifts and i will show you a still more excellent way let us pray gracious heavenly father by your son our lord and savior jesus christ and through your holy spirit I pray, Lord, that you would find the terrain of our minds and our hearts receptive to hear your word today, that it would take root uh, deep into us and bear much fruit. We thank you, Lord, for coming, uh, for living the life we could not live, for dying the death that we should have died, for resurrecting um, as the first fruits of the new life, for ascending to the Father and seated at the right hand of the, of, of the Father. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you are yet to do both for your church and for your kingdom on this earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carmona's. All right, got a little pep in my step today because I'm back from vacation. Okay, I'm the only one. Feels good. Feels real good in here already. Um, hey, we are going to start in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, but we're also going to be in Romans 12, and so um, I will tell you that we will start there and um, hopefully end over in Romans. So just as a heads up, we're not going to be in one place, and the Romans passage uh, probably won't come up on the screen, and so you'll, actually, the Romans passage will, the 1 Corinthians 1 will not. So uh, just as a reminder, we are uh, all through this summer going through a series on the Holy Spirit that we've called Empowered. Um, ultimately, it's, it's, it's our fuel for life, and um, as we've gone through this series, we have worked through a lot of different topics, um, the spirit of power, the spirit of life, of truth, adoption, wisdom, and revelation going together, sanctification, and now we're on the, three we- the third week of the spirit of generosity. Um, ultimately, it was an overview of spiritual gifts, and then last week, one of our elders, Chris, did a great job. I watched it on YouTube, and I know that you guys were sweating through it, um, and so I appreciate you guys um, bearing with the elements. Um, I hate to say that I missed it, uh, but I was in California, and it was a high of 70, and so I hate to hear it uh, that I missed that day, but nonetheless, God's sovereign, and that is what it is, but really grateful. So he, he covered what we called, um, what we're categor- categorizing as the spiritual speech gifts, the gifts of speaking. Um, and I would say this, that we're, we're categorizing these three, these three things, these three weeks in, in our gifts, ultimately because we, we see the scriptures categorizing them. And so you see the speech gifts, um, the service gifts, and the sign gifts. Um, we get these categories of our spiritual gifts out of 1 Peter 4, which actually we went through whenever I was here last, and it says this, as each has received a gift, use it friends, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who's speaking the very oracles of God and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And you go, well, where's the third one? Well, the third one is by implication, everything else ultimately. Now, here's the deal with these categories is that they are imperfect um, and they are dangerous. Because if you're not careful, you start to go, ooh, the sign gifts are the ones that really matter, Um, also known as the miraculous gifts. Um, 
or, uh, or the, the gifts of healing, right? Those are all in there, and we'll talk about those next week. But I want to tell you, they're all supernatural. They're all a gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, so one is not more important than the other, and that's actually why we're starting uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 together. Before we get there, I want to remind you of the definition that we've put before you of what spiritual gifts are, and this is what they are, or how we've defined them. An empowerment, get that now, an empowerment by the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, which God has sovereignly and graciously given to individuals at conversion for the purpose of building up the church. Now, we're not going through those, that particular uh, definition week by week, but it is good uh, reminder, is a good reminder for what we're up to and what we're talking about, this charisma uh, of an empowerment by the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you a question. A few weeks ago, we put before you uh, an assessment, right? Spiritualgiftstest.com. By show of hands, who of you have taken that spiritualgiftsassessment.com? By show of hands. Just real high, real high, real high, real high. Yeah, yeah. So um, I actually put mine down. Um, I, I apologize. I was on vacation. Don't judge me. Uh, but I did not get it done. And there's a reason for that. Um, one is I, I think I know what my gifts are at this point in my spiritual journey. Uh, but I would ask you, if you didn't raise your hand, why not? Like, why, why haven't you discovered? Maybe it's because you already know your gifts, and that's fine. If you know your gifts, great. Like, that, that, I kind of fall in that gift, in that category. I've been doing this for a while. Uh, but if you, if you haven't been doing this for a while, you haven't taken an assessment of some sort, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a huge fan of those assessments. But they are helpful to at least give you some sort of a, a fuel or a leg up to discover how God has intimately created you uh, uniquely, right? He says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that also includes our spiritual gifts that happen upon conversion. So if that's true, why not discover that, if nothing else, to get some sort of a semblance of how God has, has uniquely orchestrated your life to be how you are? And then, of course, we've seen and we know now those gifts are for the building up of the local body. So if you're not figuring that out, and you are a part of this church or another church, we're missing out because you're not digging in in this way. So I will say this, it is important, I'm imploring you to consider that, and you may be asking why, and it's really this simple, and this is why we're starting in 1 Corinthians. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Like So many times do we see Christianity as just a few people on the stage, few people on the field, and everybody else is in the stands cheering it on, or maybe just sitting there haphazardly or whatever it may be. Uh, it is not meant to be that way. This is not the everything of the Christian life. This is one tiny hour and a half of your life. I did say hour and a half. You're welcome. Hour and a half of your life every week. It is one element, an element. It's not the major, it's not the main one. It is an element to your Christian life, and yet it is an important element for the building up of the body. So didn't we just read this, that we have a tendency to kind of treat Christianity as a spectator sport? And we do that by valuing the mouth of the body more than any other part. We do that, don't we? This is what it says right there in verses 29 and 30. It says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? This is part of the speaking gifts that Chris handled last week. Are they all, are we all this way? And he goes on to say, right, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? He's basically saying, quit valuing just one part of the body. Instead, we are all, though gifted very differently, Worthy of high value. No matter if we're a mouth or an elbow or a foot or a pinky toe or a big toe or a knee. Like, I don't know about you, um, but I notice when my body's not working right or I notice the value of my body and the parts of my body when they especially quit working the right way. Like, I hit a wave in California that messed my back up that's still not right. And I remember thinking, oh, right, that part of the body is a little more fragile than the other parts. I don't have elbow problems, but I do have back and knee problems. I'm basically an old man already. All right. That's fantastic. Love it. Okay. Easy. I don't need to be in your category, sir. 
But we live in a world where we value the mouth more than any other part, where professionalism, friends, is valued over participation, especially in the Bible Belt. You want to know why we invite people on stage to play that are a part of our body and our band every week? Why do we do that? Why do we invite people part of our body, whether you're new or you've been here for a while, to read and pray? It's a subtle reminder to let you know we value your priesthood. We want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of this. We want you, even if it's just for like 10 minutes at a time, we want to include you into the into this element uh, which we're faithful towards, right? We, we believe in your priesthood. And what does that mean? It means that you have been given, according to the Bible, you have been given a unique ability and responsibility to the local body that is priestly in nature. God calls you his royal priesthood. Whether you believe it or not, that's part of your new identity in Christ, that you have a priesthood, a responsibility to the body, which is empowered by the Spirit, and it is uh, experienced and, and put into practice, really particularly through a unique gifting for the here and for the now. All right, so what does all that mean for you as we go into this sermon? Um, ultimately, is that you're invited. You're invited because you matter. Um, that we are not a spectator um, uh, sport in any way. That though the quarterback sometimes get more credit than they need to, um, the quarterback honors the of offensive line. Do they not like? Do you know who the the quarterback is to the Texans right now? I have to say right now because he's only not been here for very long. You know who the quarterback is C.J. Stroud. You know who the starting left tackle is. Ugh. Just proving the point. We value what is most visible. Most of us are like Laramie Tunsil, of course. He's the highest paid left tackle, though, in the league, or was. And he's that big of a deal, and yet we don't know his name. That's kind of proving the point of we value certain things uh, uh, more than others. And what God is going to invite us into today is that the service gifts that we're talking about today are of equal, if not more value. That, that offensive line is more valuable than that quarterback, whomever you may seem that to be. So you matter. Your gift matters. Your priesthood has been ordained by God to be used, not buried in fear or uncertainty or neglect or ignorance. And instead, I'm hoping that these, these few uh, sermons on spiritual gifts will help fan the flame of the gift which God has given you. That's what the Bible says, that we are to fan the flame of the gift that God has given us and that we are not, neg not to neglect the gift that we have. So whether you or not you think that you're, you have a, a valuable priesthood, whether or not you're, you think that your gifts are worthy of honor or not, valuable or not, it does not change how God views your gifts and views you in particular. So let's just start there with the value of every gift. And this is, again, in 1 Corinthians 12. Every gift is, value, is valuable. And if you read that passage and you got hung up at the end where it says uh, there's this ranking of, of spiritual gifts, like we could, have, we could have coffee over that, and that's fine. Uh, we'll be fine. We, we, we do coffee. Um, if you want to rank, if, if Paul obviously ranks them. Um, if you want to uh, have a coffee over uh, the earnestly seeking the greater gifts, even though he's ordained everybody to have a particular gift, yet he also says to seek the greater gifts, we could have coffee over that. But I, I really cannot uh, tackle that today. Instead, the point of emphasis today is in verses 21 through 24, which I want to read once again. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head, again, remember, the, the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Every part of the body is indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. We'll read the rest of it here in a moment. But are you seeing the value? Are you seeing the temptation? You see, you have to always wonder, why is that in the Bible when it's there? That's in the Bible because we have the propensity to value more visible parts, the parts that may be on a stage or the parts that, that demand more attention because we talk too much. 
right? The more visible parts, we give more honor and value in the local body. But what God is saying is that, no, 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 we've got to flip this, that more honor is deserved for those that make the mouth even possible. See, that's the point of some spiritual gifts here in the house, Um, and I'll just, I'll unpack that here in a minute. But ultimately, it's this, right? We create categories that do not belong uh, in reality, and Paul calls them out. If you look for me in 22 and 23, these are the categories that we have for spiritual gifts. He says right here in verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker That's a category that we have in our hearts for gifts that maybe we might neglect, the service gifts, the gifts that you probably don't appreciate in your heart when you're coming into this place unless you're a part of a team that also has a bunch of people that are gifted for service. Then you start to appreciate that. But we categorize them as they seem to be weaker. Then in verse 23, it says, and on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable. They seem to be weaker. We think they they deserve less honor, and yet that is not the truth, which we'll get to here in just a moment. Uh, The cultural moment that Paul was speaking to in Corinth was one where the church was a mess. Like, we always think that we want to go back to first century church, and like, ooh, let's rediscover the early church. I hate to break it to y'all, but it was just as much of a mess as we are today. And so if you need any evidence of that, you can go to 1 Corinthians. Um, First Corinthians was a messy, messy church, and it goes from beginning to end and how messed up they were. Uh, but they, they, they started to, to have fractions amongst them. They started to split over personalities. Like, I'm a disciple of Apollos. Well, I'm a disciple of Peter. I really like Paul's preaching. You see how they're valuing the, 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 the more honorable, the more visible gifts? And they also honored and created their own identity as a gift, as a, as a, as a church that really valued the spiritual gift of tongues. And so you ultimately have like three like chapters, which we're in one, 12, 13, and 14, that tell them and therefore us how it is that we are to appropriately value the gifts and practice particularly the spiritual gift of tongues, which again, we'll, we'll kick around next week. So they're overemphasizing spiritual maturity to be associated with one particular gift. I don't know if you know that, still happening today. They overemphasize personality and priesthood of someone who is speaking on a consistent basis. I don't know if you know this, still happening today. And just as an aside, we've been kicking around trying to figure out like what, how we're going to preach uh, the rest of August or August in particular. And I don't think we're going to do this, but I just, because we're not going to, I want to just take a moment, not in my notes, and just talk about, um, we are in a cultural moment that is pretty difficult in the life of the local church in our area. We've talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but ultimately, the temptation is going to be there for all of us to, or to some of us, to deconstruct your faith. And there is no better fuel for improper deconstruction of your faith than putting too much emphasis in a personality or a gift charismatic gift. And I just want to to, to plead with you, if you're here in this room and you are wounded because of personality or gifting or abuse of authority or whatever it may be, I want to plead with you, this is not new. This is as old as the Bible and longer, that we we would split and that we would walk away from Jesus because these people disappointed me. You know that I've been greatly disappointed by the church, and, and you know what also I've been? Greatly encouraged by the church over and over and over again. And if you just like, let's have coffee and let's just compare notes. And I think what you'll start to find is that there is no good reason to walk away from Jesus because humans have disappointed you. Humans, that's what we do (laughs) from the get go, we've disappointed each other. But Jesus doesn't. We, we sing this song on a pretty consistent basis. He's never going to let me down. He never lets me down. And I just, I just want to bring us back to the center here. Because I think Paul is calling us back to the center. That when we start to create fractions and divisions, and we do it subtly by, by, by overemphasizing gifts or personality, we're in trouble. 
And I just want to call us back to remember the main thing that God, he is going to say right here in verse 24b. Look at what it says. We do all these things. We create uh, certain categories that they seem to be weaker, right? That they, that they seem to be worthy of less honor. But that is not the way God sees it. He says it in verse 24. But God has so composed the body. This, this, this word for composed is he's mixed it together. He's a mixologist, a spiritual mixologist. Like he's put all the ingredients together exactly as he's wanted it to be. He has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. See, we may give honor to the speech part, but God gives honor to the part that lacked it. Now, what are you probably thinking right now is going, all right, what is like, give me an example of parts that lack honor. I'm going to do something that these people will not want because they purposely serve in the background but I'm going to do it anyways because it's kind of the point of the passage of like, let's just honor those who, who don't really want to be honored, but they have the gift of service. And I'll just say right now, there's a few teams that probably make that up in our church uh, of, uh, that rise to the top uh, are the AV team for me. Like through COVID, we wouldn't have made it through COVID without the AV team. And it, Um, I usually tell Carissa, who's over the AV team, and I usually tell her, all right, so remember, like, their job, and I have, have relayed this to, to Matt and many others over all that, like, their job is to go unnoticed. If we, if we notice the AV team, some, something's wrong, right? And I usually tell a pastor who's doing a wedding for the first time, hey, your job is to not be remembered. Don't, don't try and be, like, funny. This is about the bride and the groom, about the ultimate bride and groom, Jesus and his church. So just disappear into the background, let them go, who was the pastor of our ceremony? I don't know, I don't remember. And the same thing for the AV team. You probably don't know their names, unless you're like in relationship with them, but they, here's what their job is. Here's why they deserve the honor that I'm hoping to give them right now. Without them, there is no clarity of the gospel on a Sunday morning, period. End of story. Their job isn't to just, you know, turn dials and knobs, although that's what they, their, their, their jam is, like, and, and, and all that. I don't even know what they do, actually. Um, <laughs> but it's really important. I know that. Lights, slides, I mean, a, a, along with hospitality team, along with road crew, along with Grove Kids. I mean, these are people that serve in the background, that people get here far before you want to get up on a Sunday morning, and they make sure that the lights are on, that the pipe and drape is up, that the chairs are here, that the communion is set up, and they don't ever need recognition. Though their hearts might cry out for it every once in a while, they're not up on the stage saying, hey, guess what, guys? You guys aren't real Christians unless you serve here, although, again, it may be in our hearts. No, no, these, all these folks serve on a consistent basis. For the long haul, we've been doing this portable thing for eight years, almost nine. Holy moly, you kidding me right now? Nine in two weeks, it'll be nine years that we're going portable, basically. That's crazy to me. And yet everyone coming together in a less honorable, a weaker position, doing it faithfully, without complaint, Right? Needing breaks every once in a while because that's healthy, but really in a beautiful way. But if God has composed this body, mixed together this body in a way that we need mouthpieces, and we also need solid hands and feet. We need it all because all of it, the whole point of all of it is to make the gospel clear. That's what the Grove Kids is, is doing right now. They're not only hoping to make the gospel clear to the kids, but they're also giving you an opportunity to have an attention span. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the attention span that you need for me to drone on forever. All right, these are, this is the reason. Like every, every gift is valuable, right? Now, let's talk about those spiritual gifts of service. There are six words that are used in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12 that I want to boil them down into basically four different um, uh, categories to just kind of simplify it for us. So, um, and let me just state the obvious, right? Without the gifts of service, those with the gift of speech would not be heard or seen clearly, and God's message, again, would be muddied. So for those of you that took the assessment, or for those of you that don't really ever want to be seen or known, you just want to serve in the background, I just want to just pour out my heartfelt affection and gratitude for each of you. 
I mean, I, I called somebody out earlier by, I'm not going to do it by name right now, but I just was like, the great blank of the name is here. And immediately they started to turn red. And I was like, okay, like it's obvious that I'm just making a fool of myself at this point. But I just wanted to honor that person for showing up and serving behind the scenes week in and week out. All right, the spiritual gifts of service. And now this is where I want to go to Romans, um, uh, Romans chapter 12, and it will say a couple of things. And I did not even mark it, so bear with me. Romans chapter 12, and it's going to be verses 3 through 8. And I'm going to read it. And I want you to see the gifts of service here. It says the gifts of grace, but there's, in all this, I think we're going to see the gifts of service in verse 8. Some great reminders here, though. Romans 12, 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Do you see how we belong, this, this idea of interdependence here? Verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his ex exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, intermixed into all of that, I think there are, are some four really good gifts of service. The first one being a gift of exhortation. Now, again, these categories are a little loose and imperfect. You could have put the gift of exhortation in the gifts of speech category, but there's only so much time in any given sermon, especially when it's hot. And so here we are. We're putting it in the gift of service because I think not all exhortation is done with the mouth. In fact, some of the best exhortation I've ever received is just someone sitting next to me and being present through the mess. I think oftentimes we feel the pressure to fix people's problems when actually just being present in other people's stuff is really all they need to feel encouraged. And if we were able to have a word of wisdom along the way, that's just a cherry on top. Not all encouragement is done with words. Sometimes you just need to be with people. But this word for encouragement is a complex word. It's not just encouragement as if, I don't know about you, but when I think about encouraging people, I think of happy all the time and bubbly all the time, and those types of people typically make me a little nervous, right? But the happy and the bubbly is not really the gift of encouragement. The gift of encouragement has at its root this, this idea of urging someone to do the right thing. And I don't know about you, but I don't always feel warm and fuzzy inside when I hear someone else coming alongside me. Again, it's in, the, it's in the posture of coming alongside you, not confrontational, but encouraging you to and urging you to do the right but difficult thing. I don't always feel warm and fuzzy when that person comes next to me, even if they do it well. That is the gift of encouragement. That is the person that can do that really, really well. Exhortation, again, urges someone else towards the truth, towards godly living, and they are unrelenting in their desire for your spiritual best. Do you have someone that comes to mind when you think of someone who is gifted with the gift of encouragement that has encouraged you in your life? Apparently, mine are all named Paul. Like when I look back and I look at all of the people that have come alongside me to encourage me in deep, dark moments, like right when I was about to plant this church, I mean, one of, I mean, just, I needed to call the Pauls. I mean, one of them is my young life leader from high school that I still have a good relationship with. Just come alongside me, encourage me, remind me of the truth about who I am, about who God's made me to be, not reminding me or telling me that I can do it or not, just reminding me of the truth. Do you have people that have come alongside you, that have emboldened you into a course of action that is difficult, but it is godly? I would say you do have those people. If you don't know who they are, what their names are, take a moment this week. Look back over the last several years, and who's come alongside you to encourage you? Send them a text. Give them a phone call. Even better, have them for lunch. Not have them for lunch, but maybe do lunch with them. Grab a lunch with them, or a dinner, or a meal, or a coffee, sorry. Right? 
Spend some time with them in a way that you can then repay them and encourage them. Tell them thank you. A good encourager needs the fuel to be a good encourager for someone else, and that comes with gratitude. The gift of exhortation, the second gift that is lifted, listed in Romans 12, 8, right? The one who exhorts in his exhortation. In other words, he's saying, like, get after it. The one who contributes in generosity. This is the gift of giving, the gift of financial contribution. Now look, we're all called to give uh, financially, but those that are gifted to give, they look for ways to exercise their gifts. I'll give you an example of someone who I have received great encouragement. They could be an encourager, but they also fall into this gift of giving on day two of the Grove's existence, which was far before anybody knew that the Grove was supposed to exist. I went to breakfast with a guy, and I was downtrodden, and I was discouraged, and I didn't know if we were going to make it, and it was literally day two, and he brought me to breakfast, and the first thought, first words out of his mouth were, tell me about our new church. And I just remember thinking, our new church? Our, our new, okay, all right. Not tell me about your new church. Not tell me about your vision. Tell me about our new church. Oh, yes, Lord. I need that. That's healing balm. And then you go, oh, well, here's to get the encouragement. No, 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 just keep going. Because then as the, as the day went on and I just told him why I was like discouraged, like, bro, I don't know how we're going to do it. I know it's like day two, but like I just, we just had a baby. I don't know if we're going to be able to make ends meet. Um, it's going to be a, a pretty tough road to go as we get going. And he just looked at me and he goes, you know what? I've been saving up money for a long time and I didn't know why. And you just gave me my why. How much is your mortgage? And I went, okay. Maybe the Lord really is in this church planting thing. It's exactly what I needed at exactly the right time. That person has the gift of giving. They're saving up and they don't even know why. Who does that? And not to, like, for themselves, but they know they're trying to give it away. They just are looking for when the Lord shows them the opportunity, they're ready. I mean, what a, these are the people that pay for some of our kids' camps. They put money aside and like, hey, I know some people won't be able to go, but I want to scholarship them anyway. And they do it behind the scenes where no one will know, and many of us are recipients of that. What a beautiful gift. Not from the stage, the only reason why they're getting any notoriety now and without their name is because ultimately they just want to stay in the background and to support as they can. Now look, those with the gift of giving, it can go sideways. That's why the caveat is there, contribute with generosity. And I would say that that's actually not the greatest translation. Better translation is contribute with sincerity. Now, what does that mean? It means there's a warning here for all of us that have the gift of giving that we could give to get. We could give with strings attached. Um, we could give to, to, to be recognized as someone who's generous. And if you don't know this, there's a huge warning about that in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Like if you want to go and be like wowed and awed by God and also really confuzzled, as Moses would say, uh, go read Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. Moses, my son. I was talking to somebody the other day, not Moses of the Old Testament. <laughs> Moses, my son. Go read Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11, and you'll start to see like Ananias and Sapphira go and they sell a field and they present it to the apostles as everything that they had. And the Holy Spirit tells Peter, they're holding out, dude. I mean, not like, not with those words, but hey, they're holding out. He goes, this everything? Yep, it's everything. Why have you so deceived yourself and lied to God himself? Ananias drops dead. Hours later, Sapphira comes in, touting the same lie to Peter. Hey, is that everything that you got for the field that you sold? Yep, it's everything we got. Oh, man, that grieves me. You're dead too. Amazing. And the people were filled with fear and awe as a result. And you, you, you have to know why. God is starting a, a new order and a new community with his people where he does not want people to come in giving to get. Or with pretense that I'm really generous. I'm just like everyone else. I'm actually a little bit better. 
It's not a big deal that they didn't give all that they had. It's that they lied about it and they pretended it was more. See, there is this great warning for those that give. Give with sincerity. With sincerity. Third gift of service is the gift of administration, otherwise known as leadership. We talked about administration a couple weeks ago. Also, it's mentioned in verse uh, in 1 Corinthians 12. Leadership is the word that I'm going to lump those two things together in Romans chapter 12, verse 8. Administration uh, is the word for a shipmaster. A shipmaster, one who's a captain of a ship. They oversee the whole ship. They delegate tasks to others in order for the whole ship to reach this destination safely. It's closely connected to the gift of leadership and pastoring because they all work in concert together. A good administrator cannot lead well without systems, and you cannot work systems well without a concern for people. And so leadership and administration and pastoring typically go together, but not always. But you've got to be able to administer and you've got to be able to lead. The word for leadership literally means to rule or direct others. Isn't that exciting? We don't like that language a whole lot these days. Like, we don't like for someone to tell us what to do. Give you an example. My wife's, or my wife, it's weird, my daughter. uh, My daughter is a lifeguard, um, and she is 15, and she's over in a particular neighborhood, and she's trying to enforce some rules, right? But the people that she's enforcing rules are twice her age, quadruple her age, and she's just basically trying to help them obey the rules because that's what she's there to do, and they are not having it. Though she is in authority over them, she is younger than them, and they just gave her the business the whole time. We do not like to be ruled over. We do not like authority in today's age. We, in fact, despise it. This is the fuel for a lot of deconstruction. But if I could point us to the Bible and go to 1 Thessalonians 5, look at what Paul says to that church about those that are in leadership, those that are are called, gifted by God to rule and direct. He says this, we ask you brothers and sisters to respect those who labor among you and are over you. That's the word for leader, over you. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst amongst yourselves. So if you're here and you're looking for a church, if you're looking for leaders, if you're looking for any sort of good leader, you'll never find a better leadership manual than what's described in the scriptures. And this is what he describes as a really good, solid leader. Did you see it? It says this, respect those who labor among you and are over you. The one that only wants to be over you is not the one to be respected. The one that is only to be amongst you probably doesn't even deserve that high esteem of honor at all. But the one that labors among and over is not just a brother or a sister in the fight with you. But they've also taken responsibility as a father or a mother for you. And those two things go hand in hand with any solid biblical leadership. We've got to be able to be cool with some authority in life. It's why, actually, one of the reasons uh, we have those little pamphlets out there. One of them has on the top authority issues. And I used to hand them to my friend John Hilliard every Sunday. (laughs) Hey, brother, this one has your name on it. He would just laugh and throw it at me. I said, see? Among and over. Now, again, the caveat here for the administrator or the leadership is with zeal. And this has been convicting for me as I've been on vacation studying this passage. And I'm like, I am not doing this with zeal right now. But it is with zeal, with excellence, with an unrelenting pursuit of working for God's glory and not my own. The hard part in this is that those that are zealous for leadership and systems tend to expect way too much of other people way too soon. And I know I have done that with many of us over the years, and I apologize sincerely because I do it to myself. And I know that if I'm doing it to me, I've done it to you. It's one of the reasons why I don't show up for road crew at 7.30 or 7.45. Because back in the day, whoa, Administrator Lance would show up and like, nope, hate it, 
Blop. And everybody's like, do we have to go to this church still if you're going to be here? Or <laughs> Seriously, like it's sin. It's with zeal and it's with too much expectation for others. Um, but it's true. That's the shadow of gift of leadership and administration, final gift that we'll unpack, is the gift that he says in verse 8 right here. The one who leads lead with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gift of helps. I think we can lump that in with the gift of mercy because help has the sense of taking up the cause of another. You have the spiritual gift of help. If you do, you serve on the road crew or hospitality or, or out in the community with great nonprofits in our area, typically. Those are the gift of mercy, right? The gift of help is, is described in Acts 20. He says, in all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. Mercy then literally means, did you know this? Mercy literally means to do good. So for all of you that have gone down to Mercy Goods in downtown Richmond and bought a shirt that says do good, that's the word mercy just spelled out for us. It's goods that do good. It's mercy goods, if you know what that is about with attack poverty, right? It is to do good with compassion. Those gifted with mercy typically have a good eye for those that are hurting and don't just leave them in the hurt to hurt, but they step in in a compassionate and meaningful way. But they do so temporarily. Now here's the caveat with those that have the gift of help the gift of mercy. It says to do so with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness in verse 8, is it important to note that those who have the gift of helps or mercy have that gift and they, our new friends, are prone to burn out. So you've got to establish some rhythms of rest and boundaries, otherwise you're constantly going to be, quote unquote, over-functioning in the life of others around you. And you will burn yourself out trying to meet the needs of everyone around you if you don't realize you're actually not the solution. Jesus is. You see, we get twisted when those that have the gift of help or the gift of mercy start to put themselves in a position and they forget that Jesus was taken advantage of. You see, those that have the gift of help or mercy will be taken advantage of. You have to know that. People will mistake your kindness for weakness, and they will take advantage of you. And so it's no wonder that, that, that God says, with cheerfulness, with good boundaries around you so that you can, you can actually have the joy that you need to sustain that over the long haul so that when people kick you, when you're trying to help, you go, man, they did the same thing to Jesus. Let me identify with his sufferings. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 12, when one of us suffers, all of us do. We're all connected. We're all a part of this body. All right, so what must we do as a result of all of these gifts of service, right? I've just, just so if you missed them, exhortation, the encourager, the urger, uh, the gift of administration or leadership, right? You also talked about the gift of giving in all of that, and now we have talked about the gift of helps or mercy. What do we do? Well, I think it's pretty clear in Romans 12, verse 6. This is not going to get complicated. It's not going to get profound. This is the Bible. It's very simple and yet very difficult. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Now, I don't think I see a footnote here. No matter of fact, I don't. But I think the footnote that's in our mind, it's an imaginary footnote. It says, all right, if you get really good at that gift, if you take that assessment and then you get really good at it, you practice it at home for a little bit, and then you get really good at it, then you'll go and put that in deployment for the sake of others. Ooh, I'll go get seminary trained, and then I'll go. Ooh, I'm going to go get ready in some unique, crazy way. I'm going to go walk this crazy road up the California coast, and then I'll be ready to go and serve with a word of wisdom, whatever it may be. It doesn't say that. It just says, get to work. <laughs> you love how a lot of the Christian life is just basically boiled down to those simple words. Get to work. Use them. Practice them. We use the phrase a lot around here, fail forward. 
it's all right to mess it up. In fact, the best way that you could mess it up is to use them and then like have humility because you mess it up. And then you practice maturity and repentance and confession to whomever you mess it up with. And then you, and then, and then you can forgive one another. Like you see how the Christian life is all of a sudden on display. And then you receive that forgiveness and give that forgiveness. And then all of a sudden there's humility and there's bonds there being made. And God is glorified, not you. Can you see how this works if we just, if we just get into the fight with one another? Whether it's speaking or with serving or with signs. We'll talk about that again next week. I mean, it's really just a matter of just getting in the fight together. Linking, again, arm in arm, partnering with one another for the sake of the gospel. That it would be clear in how we live with one another. You see, the worst thing that I think we can do is just to bury it. To remain ignorant. To neglect whatever gift that we've been given because we were hurt in the past. Because we did that, and we tried that, and it didn't, it didn't work. I mean, do it in the context of loving community so they can go, hey, I don't know if that's your gift. Maybe we were told we have a gift that we actually don't have. Now there's all this weird pressure. Or, hey, I can see that gift in you. You keep practicing. Can we, I would love to meet with you so we could practice that. I'd love to see how that gets fanned into flame. There's a little spark there, but let's, let's, let's really fan that thing into a flame. For the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the body. Let us do these things together, remembering it's God himself, y'all. It is God himself that determined that you would have these gifts in this measure, in this body. There's no greater motivator for me than to not just discover, but to get to work. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for not withholding your gift. For patiently being a carpenter for, I mean, it must have been at least 18 years, probably when you were 12 to about 30, if not more. But in obscurity, Lord, you lived for a generation almost. And yet at the right time, you, you knew the timing was right, the place was right, the gifting was right. And the purpose was right. For your glory, to die for your people, to rise from the dead, to ascend to the Father, and then in your going, as according to Ephesians 4, you gave gifts to the church. So Holy Spirit, would you um, illumine our hearts this morning to know what we're gifted in? Would you encourage us and give us, literally, to put boldness and courage in us, urge us to do the right thing, which is to use these gifts for the betterment of the body. The world may not ever respect it, but the church is called to honor it. Lord, we're grateful for the many. We're grateful for the many in our church that serve on a regular basis, that most churches have the, the disease of the 80-20 rule. 80% of the church is getting done by 20% of the people. That is not the case with this church, and we are so grateful for the many that serve week in and week out, behind the scenes, with no pay, no, no, very little appreciation, no fanfare, So I pray that you would encourage those folks this morning. I pray that you would help those folks be reminded that you honor them. Whether we do or not, you honor them. Those that we may see as weaker or less honorable, you see as worthy of even more honor. So for the Matt Petersons in the house and the Rodney Claytons in the house and the Marlene Scanlons and the Connie Johnsons and the Kristen Madigans and the many countless others on road crew, you are seen and known by your Father. You are loved. You are remembered. And may just the simple mention not embarrass but honor. So I pray that this church would not just be the recipients of those gifts, but also those that would deploy those gifts. For the sake of the world and for the sake of the gospel being clear, in Jesus' name, amen.